Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Cryptocurrent, your host here, Richard Carthon. And today I got a really special guest working on all kinds of uh, amazing projects, um, already learning some really cool things about her. Uh, we got Rebecca with Zerion. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing very, very well. It's great to be here. Thank you. Well, excited to learn about more about you and your journey and everything that uh, you have going on. Uh, a lot of exciting stuff, especially in the, the crypto and, and even, you know, the development world yourself. I mean, you wear a lot of hats just based on, you know, conversations before hopping on. But before we dive into all of that, let's start with you. Like, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I don't know if you can hear from the accent, but I'm from South Africa originally. I'm currently sitting in San Francisco, though. And like you said, I do wear a lot of hats. So I'm currently finishing my senior year at Minerva, which is a very unconventional undergrad program where we basically travel the world as we study. So I would say that in terms of just like my academic focus, it's usually econ and data science. But I am also working at Zerion, which is a popular DeFi interface that people use. And I also do research as well with grassroots economics in Kenya, doing alternative currency systems. And yeah, like on top of that, I, I travel as I study. Um, I'm involved in way too many things, <laughs> but I've been in crypto since about 2017. And it's, I think, you know, similar to everyone in this industry, it's just kind of like a rabbit hole that you get stuck in and enjoy way too much. For sure. I mean, so tell me about that first experience. Like, how did you first learn about it? Who put it on your radar? And then just like you said, once you got into the rabbit hole, kind of explain once you got into it, like your journey to where, we, where you are today. Yeah, so I would say it started in 2017. Um, I was actually living in San Francisco here as a freshman. And, you know, this is the time of like the first bubble. And so it was kind of, it was quite impossible not to be bombarded with crypto everywhere you went. I mean, there were hackathons, there were conferences, there were meetups. And so, you know, being a college student in San Francisco, I just did a lot of these things. I mostly went for the free food, to be honest, <laughs> and <laughs> <Yeah>. the perks. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> and yeah, that, that's what got that's what got me into crypto was the free food, actually. Um, but from there, I did work for a Japanese crypto exchange. Uh, I was just always really, really interested in new forms of money. And I also think that, you know, when you're young and you're curious, you're not thinking about like, oh, but is it regulated? And, you know, is this a safe industry to go into in terms of the job market? It's just like, hey, this is really cool. People are building really cool things. Um, so I think it's very much just a combination of, of timing and coincidence that I was in the right place. No, real quick. So like on that, well, something I wanted to talk about with it is that, you know, we talk about sparking your curiosity, right? And it, we are all about empowering people to follow their curiosity, find something that they're passionate about and kind of like, you know, moving it forward. And it's exciting to hear you talk about that. Like, you're not necessarily looking at all the downsides of it. You're just looking at, oh, this is interesting. Let me look into it and let me see how you know, I can apply this in, into my own livelihood. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I think this kind of goes into the second experience that I had because after working for the Japanese crypto exchange, which is, you know, very much on like the for-profit side of things, very much a corporate environment, I learned about this organization called Grassroots Economics. And they were basically taking the same kind of high-tech technology and applying it in really low infrastructure communities in Kenya. And so it was great because I think from early on, I had this exposure to crypto kind of on both sides of the spectrum of for-profit and non-profit um, and kind of looking at how people are using the, the same concepts, but in really, really different ways. So it gave me a feel of what's possible. And I think that's kind of what had me hooked. That is awesome. And, you know, the fact that you got into this, you know, very early and for everyone listening, uh, of course, you can, you can listen to this, but you also can um, watch this on YouTube for everyone that's listening. If you haven't checked that out, please go check us out and subscribe. But another good thing ab about what you just said is, you know, we also recently started this thing called Cryptocurrent Network. So we're working with various universities across uh, the U.S. Um, to educate them and to expose them to different financial opportunities like, uh, you know, fintech, uh, crypto, blockchain, you know, all of these different economic tools that are more relevant to, I mean, our generation from the millennials, Gen Zers, everything else. Like, the dynamic of economies and how the money transfer in the world is changing. And if you can learn this stuff early and be at the, the forefront of this, the, the windows and the doors of opportunity are, are limitless. And it's, it's really, really cool to hear how, you know, once this curiosity got sparked in, you, you kind of dove into it. And so, you know, as you were kind of studying all this, I know that you know, you, you, you somehow got a part of Zerion. So kind of tell us about that transition of, you know, how did you like, how did that start and how did you become a part of it? 
Yeah. Um, so it's, I think it's maybe a bit of a common story that you'll find in, in startups that are started by just really young people. The founder of Zirian, Yevgeny Yutev, um, used to be a Minerva student. And nice. so it was very much just a community thing. I, they were looking for a couple of hires in their growth division. And um, I was one of the few people in my class that is really, really heavily involved in crypto. And so it was very much just like mutual friends saying, hey, you should check out this company. I know that they're hiring. Um, so I, yeah, I guess I was very lucky in that sense because it was from my kind of my community that I found out about it. Yeah, which is awesome. And so kind of tell us about, you know, what is it, you know, what's your role in it? And, you know, what's, uh, you know, where are you at right now as a company and, and what's going on? Mm -hmm. So my role is head of growth. Um, Zirian is a very, very early stage startup, although they have kind of been operating as a team since roughly 2016. So I guess you could say that's old in the DeFi space, considering <laughs> the most projects like, you know, two weeks old. At least that's right. what it feels like. Um, and yeah, part of my day to day job is really just, you know, your, your standard um, growth role activities. So things like managing social media, content, um, but also a lot of it that's really interesting is just user research. You know, I think DeFi is such a nascent field. Um, and in terms of how people interact with it, like Azerian, you know, we're a platform that in many ways pioneers the kinds of features that people will come to expect. And so you, you it's really nice because you have the sense of, oh, you know, like this product that I'm designing or this this user research that I'm that I'm looking at is something that someone is going to end up using. Um, so it's very meaningful and fulfilling in that sense. And then, of course, there's also just like generally keeping up with the DeFi market, knowing what kind of protocols and tokens are people interested in. Um, how do people want to categorize and view their portfolio? I think inherently across the DeFi space, it's a very different business model, right? So it's not like we charge people to use our services. Um, right. And so it, it it very much feels like kind of boots on the ground because the people that use your product are the people that you have to interact with on a daily basis if you want to design something that works for them. Right. And, you know, what you're working on in, in your particular aspect of growth is super interesting to me because when DeFi first came out and I had a couple of guests on last year about this, I, you know, I call it the loop of like what you need for a, a successful entire user experience. And a lot of what has been spun up was like, oh, we have all of these different use cases. Oh, we could use it to solve this problem. Or we could solve this. But then they didn't take the use case of like, okay, now we built this thing. How do we get users to actually use it, understand it, know it's a real thing, and then also have it go back into the ecosystem. So it like completes the circle. So can you kind of speak to that a little bit of like, you know, I know that's a challenge that y'all are probably even trying to tackle, but you know, what are some things that Zerion's uh, doing to help solve that issue? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm really glad that, that you brought this up. It is spot on. And people underestimate how much user experience and just user interface is so important, right? Um, we use terms like DeFi, you know, decentralized finance, crypto, blockchain, at the end of the day, like these are technologies, yes, but people are going to interact with them through specific products and services. So in the case of DeFi, it's dApps, you know, decentralized apps, whether it's right. Zerian, that's a portfolio tracker, whether it's a specific, um, you know, exchange like Uniswap that a lot of people are familiar with. The way that that looks and feels is very much going to determine how much DeFi gets adopted. And so this is something that Zirian has been trying to solve since day one, which is just really basically, how do we present your portfolio to you, right? Something as simple as that um, in the world of decentralized protocols is actually not that simple because you're pulling from different protocols, you're pulling from different asset types, right? So we're not just talking about tokens. We're also talking about things like um, NFTs, non-fungible tokens. So this right. is not something that Zerian currently supports, but ideally, you know, you want to see everything that you own on the Ethereum blockchain in one place. You don't have, you don't want to have to open 10 tabs just to know what's going on. And I think, you know, up until say like a year ago, that was pretty much the user experience. Um, and that's why no one is going to their grandma saying, hey, you should really get into DeFi because right. it's, it's not ready for your grandma. You know, it's, it's just not easy enough. Um, and so I think it's really, really good to see more projects and teams that are looking at, OK, how do we just design a better user experience? Because without that, it doesn't matter how cool your projects are, you know, how much APY you can get on your yield farming. Like right. no one's going to use it. Exactly. Oh, my gosh. Like you're. 
You're speaking my language because like I've had this conversation with multiple people on the show previously about the importance of how do we get this to become so easy that grandma can use it, just like you said. And when I look at the bell curve of where we are in the, in the crypto realm, like I think we're on the cusp of uh, first adopters, uh, early adopters to like first adopters. I think we, we were hitting that stride just because of the last, you know, boom, that's basically happened at the end of 2020 going into 2021. But still, we're still so early in this as mom and dad and grandma, whatever, starting to ask, hey, what's this whole Bitcoin thing again? Tell me more about it. And now that that's coming, as they start to learn about these other things like DeFi, which that was another buzzword that's thrown around, if they don't know how they can like get into it and it's easy, one, two, three step, like you can just hand this thing to somebody and they can set it up. That's where the biggest issue is. And the fact that y'all are taking the approach to solve that problem and spend a lot of time and talking to people and learning and refining, like, you know, that's how you play the long game in this. Like if DeFi is not going anywhere, which I don't believe it is, it's just a matter of how do you get to mass adoption and an interface that is easily accessible, then like, I mean, it sounds like y'all are doing the right steps because like, to me, that is the bread and butter of what makes a great product. And, and, and on that, you know, uh, I know outside of Zerion that you, you work on some other things as well in the crypto space. I know that you also do some development and some other things as well. Can you kind of talk to, you know, how, how are you able to utilize all the various tools that you're learning in, in school and in applying it to, um, you know, uh, everything in the crypto blockchain world. Yeah. So, you know, when people think of crypto or, or blockchain, they, te- they tend to think of the financial use case, right? Because that, right now that's the biggest one. So people think about um, the profit that they can make on Bitcoin, or they'll think about apps like Coinbase or Zerian. Um, but they tend to forget that, you know, ultimately we're just talking about a technology and at, at its core, when you're redesigning monetary systems, that has huge implications um, in terms of how people think about money, how people use money, how people have access to it. And so a lot of the research that I've done is just on the applications of alternative currency systems, pretty much in the places that you would least expect it. So the majority of my work has been with Grassroots Economics, which is this NGO in Kenya that I talked about. Uh, And they've been in operation for almost over 10 years at this point. So they didn't start off as a blockchain-based project. They started off with just paper vouchers. They would go into communities in Kenya and say, hey, what would happen if we created our own currency, right? Because national currency is incredibly volatile. You know, if you're a farmer and your currency loses a lot of its value overnight, like that's it. And we've seen extreme use cases, or rather extreme just examples of this in places like Venezuela or Zimbabwe. You know, those are the popular countries that come up But at the end of the day, you know, so much of how we use money is just affected by things beyond our control, like the central bank or or the state of your politics in your country. And so the whole point of alternative currencies is to try and get local economies to be more resilient so that even if your economy crashes at a national scale, at a local scale, you know, people still need to be employed. People still have work to do. People still have groceries to sell. That doesn't stop. What's really important is that you have the money to do so. And this is a lot of what grassroots economics has done. So all of my research has been around, well, you know, what happens when you create these alternative currency systems? How does this affect the way that people trade with each other? How does this affect um, women's access to money? So all of these kinds of development questions. And then, of course, all of this is based on a cryptographic blockchain. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. And, you know, something I want to talk a little bit further into, and and one of the things that when I knew that crypto was going to be massive when you see the scale of how practical it is for other countries. When you hear about, just like you said, farmers who maybe ship their products uh, or produce to the U.S. or other places and they ask to be paid in crypto. Or you have, you know, um, just like you said, the, the volatility in some local governments where they, it's a lot more stable, even though the crypto market's still volatile, it's still more stable than a local government. And with COVID going on around, you know, globally, it kind of shook up everything and kind of, you know, made the case for why a decentralized currency or a digital currency has a lot of use case or even, you know, from a practical standpoint of like how much cash do people actually walk around with? It it doesn't really happen. So where do you see with, you know, with either grassroots or everything else that has affected um, this attention that's being brought to, uh, digital currency world, like where do you think we're headed in this next decade um, compared to like where we were before COVID and everything else kind of happened? 
Yeah, I mean, look, ideally, and I think people are waking up to this, um, you know, different currencies can serve different purposes, and right. that's okay. And I, and I think from an institutional perspective, people are realizing that that is the case, right? So why does a person prefer to be paid in US dollars versus Indian rupees, right? It's because, like, we still live in a, in a, in a world where dollar, the dollar denominates global mar- markets, right? So it's, right. it's seen to be more stable, um, and, and this is just like a very basic intuitive answer, but I think the same is for things like crypto. So when you look at something like local currency systems, it's not saying that we want to replace national currency systems. It's just saying that maybe if we want to focus on development at a local scale, and if we want to focus on keeping resources at a local scale, a different currency system would help us do that. So I think where we're headed, and you know, we're seeing this across the board, it's not just in terms of money. Look at the way that people are looking at tokenization in the art world, right? Yeah. So the idea that like in terms of managing the economic relationships that we have with artists and musicians and people who do things that, you know, so much of their, their creativity often gets lost in the just the quantification that we exist under, like in a, in a stand capitalist system, tokenization models allow you to think outside the box. And so I think, you know, to a question of like, where do we go from here over the next 10 years? I think we're just going to start seeing more and more people using alternative currencies, whether that's a crypto, whether it's an NFT or a token, um, to like systems that we're so used to seeing and systems that unfortunately I think have been very restricted in terms of the way people interact with them because of just that economics convention. Right. And a word that you said multiple times today, access. I think that we are living a more accessible world as long as you have access to internet. You now have a lot more access to different types of currency, right? You're not just limited to a local currency or or what have you, as long as you have access to some sort of uh, wallet or exchange or what have you. Well, Pretty much. you know, you don't even need the internet, actually. <laughs> you don't wow. need the internet. I mean, grassroots economics doesn't, it's not working on a smartphone, right? You can use things like USSD codes. You can still interact with the blockchain if you're using a Nokia brick phone from 2005, right? Wow. So like, there's really no excuse. Um, it's possible. You just need more people building these things. Right. Well, like, can you talk to that a little bit more? Because that's news to me. That sounds awesome. Can you kind of... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, so the model is really simple, right? In the same way that when you, you know, want to check your account balance on your phone plan, you're interacting with your phone carrier and you use something called USSD codes. And this is basically, you know, you send the SMS and it's like press one if you want to see your balance, press two if you want to do this. Um, Well, you can actually connect those to higher tech stuff. So in the case of grassroots economics, although they're running on a blockchain, when people make a trade on their system, they're just using their phones. And the majority of those people don't have access to internet or don't have smartphones. Um, But when they're placing a trade, that the interaction they have with their phone is also an interaction with the blockchain. And so, you know, it's the movement of cryptographic tokens. So yeah, it's really not that complicated. Um, I think it's just like, sometimes we get ready, you know, I talked about earlier the user experience and I think we get really caught up in the user experience for specific kinds of users who have specific access. Um, But if you look at the majority of the unbanked, right, you actually want to have really low scale, low key stuff. But as long as it works, that's what really matters. Yeah. And I mean, that's what I love about this space. And and that is unique is that, like you said, there's no excuse. There are ways that we can get this done and give access to people. Um, we just got to keep building it, just like you said. But you also have to know that it's an option, right? Like for a lot of people, just like me today, like didn't even know that that was a, an option or a solution. Yeah. So if a creative person can now see like, oh, wow, how could I then apply that in other places or other elements. And, you know, that's, that's how you get the, the ball rolling. But, you know, I think that's really unique. And, you know, one more thing, that, one more topic that I kind of want to bring up with you is just, you know, with everything that you are observing in the entire um, ecosystem that is crypto and blockchain, what are some things that are um, on your mind or things that you're observing that you think other people should be looking out for as well? Um, hmm. I think, look, this previous bull run that we've had is is just one of them, which is really like, watch out for the changes that are happening. I think with more and more institutions investing heavily 
in Bitcoin and Ethereum and other currencies as well, that's pretty much an indicator that you can no longer just dismiss this as magic internet money, right? Um, right. I hope, I sincerely hope people aren't still doing that, but you know, they're there. Um, so I think, yeah, just realize that like at the end of the day, this is a technology and it's not just about the money, right? It's not just about the financial aspect. We're talking about a technology that is going to disrupt every industry and it is already doing so whether it is for music, whether it is for the way we give aid in, in, in a development context, whether it's for the way we invest our money or how we send money across borders to family members. Um, these are really, really big disruptive changes. And you know, if you're in a position where you're eager to learn and you're curious about this now, there's no such thing as too late, right? Like, okay, right. you might not make the 400% profit that people are talking about in terms of Bitcoin, but you're in a really good position to learn because I think, you know, that there's so many job opportunities as well. And we just need more people who are willing to think creatively and who are willing to build um, because that's how we get there. That's how we get to next. Definitely. And I, I really like that answer. And, you, you know, beginning of the year. So at the time of this recording, we're in 2021 um, early. And um, I wrote uh, this, uh, this uh, post. And happy to, happy to share it. I'll put it in the in the show notes. But one of the first things I have on there is that if you would have had Bitcoin when it first came out in 2010, um, if you'd put twenty dollars in when it hit thirty thousand dollars, you would have made nine million dollars. Now with Zerion, with what you're doing with that, right? There are a lot of low cap, less than a dollar type of opportunities that are out there. Now we're not saying that all of them are going to be like Bitcoin hit thirty thousand dollars, but even if it's a tenth of what that was or whatever, like. There is just so much opportunity. You don't have to have a lot of money to potentially see this kind of return on investment. Like that was 10 years where there's not too many places in 10 years you can see that kind of ridiculous return. So the whole point of what I'm saying and what I'm going to continue to encourage everyone listening is you're not involved, get involved. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You can spend $5, $10, $20, whatever is, whatever makes sense to you. Find, educate yourself, find a project that makes sense. Go to Zerion, check out some DeFi projects, something that you can get involved with and, you know, find a way to, to, to get involved. And again, you don't have to put a lot in, but it could literally change your life by just getting um, your foot in the door. So, you know, I really do appreciate you spending some time with us today, Rebecca. I think you dropped a ton of good knowledge and nuggets for people to um, think on. But what is a final thought that you want to leave with all of our listeners here today? Um, hmm, that's a good one. I think. Like, I'm very biased when I say this because, you know, I, I work for Zerion, I've worked for a crypto exchange, I've worked for a development organization. Um, and as much as much as what you just said is true, I want people to remember that even if you're not doing it to get the extreme profits, even if, you know, you're going to lose the $100 that you put in, which is, let's be honest, is the case for like a lot right. of investors. Um, they always say, you know, be willing to lose what you put in. Even if that is the case, it is still so, so valuable. And the best way to think about it is like, think about the early days of the internet, right? This is a technology that everyone's going to be using. This is a technology that you're better off knowing about now. And on top of that, there are so many resources out there. So if you're listening to this and you're like, I have no idea what DeFi is. I don't even know where to get started. I mean, a simple Google search, Twitter search, whatever you want. Um, there are tons of tutorials, right? If you're into things like investing, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of really good information out there. There's also a lot of good, bad information. Um, so right. you just you just got to get started somewhere, right? And then the discernment comes with the experience. Awesome. Well, um, I definitely appreciate that. Um, I think that's a great final thought for everyone listening. Um, yes, there's there's peace and value, just like she said. Um, be willing to lose what you put in, but get involved find a way. Like it's not necessarily all about the money. There's a lot of educational pieces that come with it. There's a lot of great people that you can meet again through this podcasting experience. I've met so many smart people working on amazing projects that I would have never even considered had I not just been in this space. So, you know, if you are in a group of, of your friends or whatever it is, the ones that aren't your crypto blockchain friends, you know, start talking about crypto. Just talk about a thing here or there. Eventually they're going to listen. I think at the turning point for one of my friends, all of a sudden he hit me up and, and bought his first crypto. It was like $5. It was like, oh my gosh, it's, it's now worth like $750. i have never seen that kind of thing happen in a week or whatever. And like, you know, just little excitement. But like whole point is like, once you just start getting involved, you're more invested because you are invested. Um, Absolutely. But, like, 
as you're giving that example, just really quickly, uh, I had a friend who I, you know, I walked through a Zerian demo with, um, I think it was like six months ago. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, just put in like $50 just to see what happens. And I think he forgot about the fact that he has a wallet. So you've actually reminded me, I need to reach out to him because it's now worth like 500 or something exactly. like that. So that's going to be a really nice surprise for him. <laughs> Right. And, and that's another thing you can set and forget, you know, put some stuff in there. Don't forget your passwords though. Don't be like the guy yeah. who has 200 <laughs> down your million Bitcoin and lost it. Don't be that person. Um, that's a whole nother subject for another day. But again, Rebecca, thank you so much for sharing everything with us. What are ways that people can connect with you and learn more about what you have going on and more about Zerion? Yeah. So um, you can reach me on Twitter, uh, Rebecca underscore Amelo. Yeah, so good luck trying to spell that. <laughs> Put them in the show notes so people can find it. I'm sure. also on Instagram um, and I also have my personal website, www.rebeccamcamelo.com. You can find out about all the stuff that I do. Um, also non-crypto things. I'm very, very passionate about African startups, African identity. Um, so yeah, you can go down the rabbit hole with me. Awesome. Well, again, Rebecca, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. And for everyone listening, stay cryptocurrent. Hey, Cryptocurrent crew, you asked and we delivered. We have received multiple requests for access to cool crypto and blockchain projects that you could use immediately. Well, we have recently launched our partnerships page. If you go to our website and go to the partnerships tab, you'll be able to see multiple companies that have partnered with us to not only give you access to the cool products that they have to offer, but then also give you cool discounts to get started today. So please go to our website, go to the partnerships tab and check out the various partners that we have today. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information on today's episode and all of our episodes, please visit us at www.crypto-current.co. You can also find a link in the show notes. Want to stay up to date in the latest news in cryptocurrency? Sign up for our newsletter today. You'll receive daily emails Monday through Friday that are personalized and curated content specific to you and your interest, powered by artificial intelligence. You can either go to our show notes or go to our website to sign up today. Are you an accredited investor looking to invest in cryptocurrency? Crescent City Capital can help. Go to crescentcitycapital.com for more information. I don't know if you've noticed, but the quality of our podcast each week are improving. I can only thank my amazing producer, Andrew DeRitter with DeRitter Productions, who has been putting all of this together. If you have any podcast, music, or audio needs, please go to DeRitterProductions.com. That's D-E-R-I-T-T-E-R Productions.com. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Cryptocurrent with Richard Cargon. We'll be back with more exciting developments from the world of blockchain and cryptocurrency next week. But until then, stay cryptocurrent.